The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well... There's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds OK. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, 
so you have to leave your car somewhere else and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's OK, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a tutor talking to a group of philosophy students. First, look at questions 11 to 13. For these questions, complete the blank spaces in the table as you listen to the first part of the talk. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr Russell, and I am your tutor for philosophy this year. I think we're all here. Let's see. Five, six, seven. Yes, that's everyone. Before we look at the three lectures you've had on philosophy this week, I would just like to run through a few things about what you can expect of me as tutor and what in turn we expect of you. As for myself, my function as tutor is to help you in all things relating to your work in the philosophy course. The help that I am able to give is, of course, mainly academic. For personal matters, I can refer you to other support services in the university, ranging from counselling to um, welfare. One thing that I would point out is that if you feel that you need to talk to someone, no matter how insignificant it is, don't leave it. Oh, and the last thing is, if you do need to make an appointment, the times are listed on the door of my room. You just write your name in a time slot. Uh, but I would point out that the appointment slots get booked up quite quickly. If it's urgent, catching me between sessions is the best idea. That way we can sort something out quickly. Um, no questions? Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 14 to 19, circle the correct letter, A, B or C. OK. As regards you as students, the tutorials are voluntary. You're not obliged to attend, but you are encouraged to do so. Last year, for the first time, a register was kept of students attending lectures and this year tutors are being asked to keep a register of tutorial attendance. This is not a formal register and not all tutors will be doing it, but in the philosophy department all of us have chosen to keep registers. Another point that's being emphasised this year is punctuality. 
When we did exit questionnaires, we found that people arriving late for tutorials and lectures was the single most annoying thing for the majority of students.、Mm. I would therefore ask you to try to be on time for the tutorials、mm. and for all your other classes, for that matter.、Mm -hmm. As regards the tutorials themselves, we will have a review of the philosophy lectures of the week before, with the discussion being led by one of you each week. There is, of course, some planning involved, but you should rely primarily on the notes you made at the lectures. This will not take up the whole of the ninety minutes allocated to the tutorial. For the rest of the time, we will look at a particular philosopher, period, or concept for which you will be expected to do some preparation each week. This will range from reading about a particular individual or concept to preparing a brief outline on a subject of your choice. How much you put into this depends on you, but we're not expecting in-depth analysis at this stage.、Um, are there any questions so far? I just like to ask whether the work we do in the tutorials counts towards our continuous assessment, and if so, how much? I was just coming on to that point. All the work you do in the way of essays and project work that is graded counts towards your continuous assessment grades. The mini presentations and lecture discussions will not be graded, but obviously, as time goes on, these activities will, I hope, have an impact on your work and hence your scores. Does that answer your question? Basically, yes. But what about that? Is the end of part two? You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first. Have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about help the children in Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called the Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community, and although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons. I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing: we don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number, and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About twenty pounds per canister, and we'll need about ten. And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? 
Well, there are over a thousand students in the school, so if even one third of the students buy one, we'd need about three hundred and fifty balloons. We've decided to order five hundred so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about one p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about fifty pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of one pound fifty, and we sell all five hundred of them, we'll end up making a profit of one pound per balloon. So that's five hundred pounds in total. That's fantastic, and it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event, who's going to give us a thousand pounds. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount, a thousand instead of five hundred? We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. Okay. Let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful. Ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. River dance is an expression of modern Irish culture, but it is based on a culture which had its golden era from the sixth to the ninth century. Before that period, Irish culture was oral and based on a love of complicated stories and poetic styles. But in the sixth century, something wonderful happened. Writing was introduced by missionaries. From then on, the culture of Ireland began to develop in ways impossible before, and had considerable influence in northern Europe in the period up to the ninth century. With the invasions which began in the ninth century, this golden age collapsed, and there never was any real recovery. There were no wealthy kings to sponsor the poets and scholars, so the tradition survived only in a form. Which the peasants liked. The love of story and song did not die, 
but no real attempt was made to find a distinctive Irish style until the end of the 19th century, when Irish nationalism began to influence writers in English called Anglo-Irish literature. There are many famous writers from that period. There is also William Butler Yeats, George Bernard Shaw and Samuel Beckett, all of whom have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. In all, Ireland has received the Nobel Literature Prize four times. When you consider we have only a population half the size of Beijing, you see how unusual that is. Now, let me talk about the music. The Irish love of music has succeeded in surviving the change from Irish, the native language, to the language of the invader, and has once more begun to blossom and become influential outside the country. Irish music was reduced to being the language of the country people and was dying out as people moved to the cities. Young city people did not want to listen to peasant music, although we were all told it was important. Some efforts were made to make it attractive to city people, but largely without success. More recently, this has begun to change and since the 1980s has taken off. But modern Ireland has been looking for more than just a revival of traditional music. Many of the most famous popular singers in the world are Irish. U2, Enya, The Cranberries and many others. There are 10,000 people employed in Ireland in the music industry. River dance is an expression of that new interest in the old and that ability to understand the new. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So this was today's listening. We all appreciate your efforts and also do subscribe for daily real exam level practice as practice can give you your desired band score.